Welcome to Acid Horizon, and welcome to another episode of Concepts in Focus. It's been a while since I've spoken about Foucault, but considering the fact that we're about to deliver some, I think, pretty exciting Foucault material in the coming weeks, I felt it appropriate to give a very general introduction to Foucault's conceptual framework. We will focus on two of the more broadly read texts in Foucault's vast array of material, Discipline and Punish, and the first volume of the history of sexuality. Foucault opens his analysis of the body of the condemned in Discipline and Punish with a seemingly simple query. What precipitated the disappearance of the scaffold? Foucault writes this, Among so many changes, I shall consider one the disappearance of torture as a public spectacle. Foucault notes this decision to consider this disappearance just after providing an extended delineation of a timetable conceived of by Léon Faucher for the House of Young Prisoners in Paris. The supposedly stark contrast drawn between a nauseating depiction of the extended execution of Damien the Regicide where his body is pulled limb from limb and incinerated in front of a crowd, and the exceedingly managerial depiction of the ideal daily life of young Parisian convicts lays out a remarkable amount of what is at the heart of Foucault's work in this period of his scholarship. Central in this analysis will be an introductory look at Foucault's theory of power knowledge and its relationship to resistance, as well as his genealogical methodology. What will also be covered are the central tenets of Foucault's notion of power in Discipline and Punish, and the transition from a regime of swift punishment, motions meant to ceremoniously reestablish the power of the sovereign over those who would think to present an affront to his regime, to a disciplinary society and its proliferation of docile bodies. Of course, there are so many literary lines of analysis we could take, and this is only one. However, this delineation of the shift away from mechanisms of sovereign power towards the disciplinary society holds within it a fundamental criticism of our notion of history. Foucault's methodology, what he calls a genealogy, is one that attempts to thwart our understanding of human history as the slow march of egalitarian development. Foucault's method to historically treat power is significantly expanded in the first volume of the history of sexuality, and I'll provide my own explication pertaining to the ground that it covers that discipline and punish does not. One way to easily understand this distinction, and hopefully this will make more sense at the end of the episode, is that if Discipline and Punish largely covers what Foucault calls the anatomopolitical pole, the history of sexuality provides an explication of this other pole of power, the biopolitical. But in order to understand the development of these two poles, what we'll also need to touch on are the changes of power's hold over the body and the importance of what Foucault will consider power's hold over life. Then, a discussion of the function and presence of resistance in his work will sort of bookend this explication and how it contributes to a key element of the development of Foucault's theory of knowledge. So let's start with discipline and sovereignty. The juridical and political transitions presented in Discipline and Punish surrounding sovereign power and the regime of disciplinary power are admittedly pretty complex. However, one can start to gain a better understanding by focusing on the shifts in the status of the body and the emergence of a system that circulates around management, direction, and perpetual punishment and what Foucault describes as the soul. Foucault starts with an analysis of the condemned body in its terminal relation to a juridical action. He moves to an analysis of the docile body with its perpetual and incremental relationship with apparatuses of normalization and disciplinary institutions. The executed individual is at the end of their existence. They manifest the truth of the power of the sovereign. But the figure who is disciplined 
manifests a very particular kind of production, one that is fundamentally different. Foucault's genealogy of the juridical theory of the late Middle Ages is, in some ways, very specific to the Ancien Régime, and it's largely influenced by the work of Ernst Kantorowicz. And he draws a contrast between the body of the condemned and that of the king. For Foucault, the body of the king is not some sort of symbol, but rather a real material force. Damien the regicide presents an affront to the king, and in doing so, an affront to the notion and political force of sovereignty itself. The spectacle of the scaffold is the mechanism by which the king or the prince can reestablish the truth of the expanse of their power and the truth of the crime committed by the individual. By tearing the individual apart and setting them ablaze in front of a crowd of onlookers, one is able to reestablish the truth of power and the truth of disobedience. Foucault writes this in Discipline and Punish. By breaking the law, the offender has touched the very person of the prince. And it is the prince, or at least those to whom he has delegated his force, who seizes upon the body of the condemned. The body of the condemned is seized upon by executioners and torturers that act as a cog between the prince and the people. These acts of ceremonial confrontation, these games of representation between the body of the king and the body of the condemned come to define a key element in Foucault's conception of sovereign power. The public execution and acts of public torture are events that carry a specific but almost immediate and ephemeral danger. It's an open display and confrontation between the violence of the personated sovereign and the possibility of the violence of spectators. If an executioner fails to kill a condemned man swiftly, often a revolt manifested. If passerbys or onlookers developed a particular affinity for the body of the condemned, it could result in the overturning of the entire ceremony. The body of condemned versus the body of the incarcerated individual could certainly draw an adequate contrast between these two systems, disciplinary and sovereign. Under disciplinary apparatuses, the way in which the body becomes a target of power will fundamentally change. Though a considerable amount of time is spent on the ceremonial obliteration of the body of Damion. There are other figures Foucault uses to draw contrasts between sovereign and disciplinary societies. One of those figures is the student. The other is the changing nature of the prisoner, from the traveling public chain gang to the iterated and slowly managed private interior prisoner. The one that I'm going to focus on is one that you may be familiar with because long time listeners may remember an episode I did on Foucault a long time ago on docility. The figure is that of the soldier. The figure of the soldier in the 17th century was, according to Foucault, something that could be recognized from afar. They bore certain signs of the regime beneath which they fought. However, this all changed in the 18th century. The soldier became something that could be crafted. New forms of knowledge in the domains of human sciences turned the soldier from something that had to be carefully chosen as the blazon of the regime's power to something that, like clay, could be formed. In the 18th century, disciplinary technologies made possible new procedures that could break down the body and reconstruct it entirely. The docile body of the soldier is an instantiation of disciplinary power par excellence. So many of the fundamental theses of discipline and punish, as well as what makes it a unique work of political philosophy and history, can be found in this figure of the docile body. At the end of all these interactions between the subject and apparatuses targeted at normalizing them is, ideally, 
the docile body. This body is a productive, normalized body that is, and this is really important, full of utility. Discipline is a political anatomy of detail. The body is now treated mechanically, reduced to its musculature, to its most incremental movements. And this is why Foucault draws such a fascinating line of comparison between the materialisms spawned by Leibniz and Lemaitre to Napoleon. This new technology of power has a different modality from the sword descending from the sovereign down on the neck of the dissident criminal. It is an infinitesimal power over the active body. It is uninterrupted. It is perpetual. This is not just unique to the barracks or the workshop or the schoolhouse. This panoptic gaze has a temporality that's entirely foreign to the way in which we understand the king's power, the way in which we understand requests or what we're called lettre de cachet for the king to send men to problematic provinces in order so that bad actors could be imprisoned and publicly tortured. It's completely alien to the punitive measures that were put in place during the Ancien Regime. All these forms of intercepting abnormality and attempting to redirect individuals, whether one finds them in the children's reformatory, the hospital, the schoolhouse, or the prison, have the goal of normalization. This means that we have to break with an understanding of carceral violence that is purely exclusionary, which is certainly one of its most crucial functions. As Foucault notes in an earlier book, Madness and Civilization, it's also of equal import that one notes that the goal of normalization is not to be seen as purely repressive. No doubt there is a repressive element to when a drill sergeant strikes a soldier who cannot maneuver properly or hold a rifle in the correct manner. However, the interaction also produces something. It produces and influences a particular mode of subjectivation. The subject function of the soldier, of the student, of the apprentice, of the factory worker, etc., etc. This, in part, is why Deleuze loves to cite Rossellini's film, Europa 51, when the protagonist says, looking upon a field of workers, that she thought she was seeing convicts. All these new systems, these byproducts of the reforms of prisons, of the hospitals, of the asylums, of the barracks and the schoolhouses, they all produce new forms of knowledge as well. Foucault writes this, in becoming the target of new mechanisms of power, the body is offered up to new forms of knowledge. The birth of criminology Advancements in military sciences, pedagogical sciences, scientific psychology, all of these, to Foucault, have their foundation in this advent of a plethora of new humanities. This is why Foucault quips, it so happens that the historians of the human sciences date the birth of scientific psychology at this time, the time of the birth of the prison. Normalizing power in the age after the late 18th century and the early 19th century is slowly beginning to be firmly encased in a medicine of psychiatry that provided it with a new, what Foucault calls, scientificity. Around the delinquent, the abnormal child, the soldier, and the asylum patient, one sees a new series of knowledges begin to form. Knowledges that then, in turn, strengthen the discursive formations that serve as their theoretical frames of reference. But to Foucault, these forms of knowledge and these practices of normalization, they don't remain inside the prison. In fact, what we find later is that the prison is an eventuality for an individual who has moved through all of these other systems of normalization. Foucault writes that the carceral archipelago transported this technique from the penal institution to the entirety of the social body. The practices of the penal colony of Maitre are no longer merely an exception, but become a day-to-day -day experience within society. Disciplinary power is that which aims at the production and maintenance of particular modes of behavior, a management and direction of the soul. And, of course, the normalization of abnormal subjects and bodies. It is no longer a situation where straying activities are interrupted by the violence of the sovereign. The violence 
is now perpetual and infinitesimal. Society itself becomes punitive for Foucault. The activities of life and the functioning of the matrix of prohibitions and legalisms start to become indistinguishable in the punitive society. Disciplinary power, counter to what many say about it in introductory texts to Foucault, even essentially Deleuze, should not be understood purely as a series of spaces that are sequestered, but in fact should be understood as the deployment of apparatuses of normalization of activity. It's not simply that you're in an office or that you're in a factory or that you're in a prison. It's that one is to take up a subject function and one is to maneuver through the office. It's a kinetic politics, not simply one of enclosure, a politics of movement, a politics of gesture, but a malignant one. Now that we've sort of like briefly discussed disciplinary power, or at least enough so that you can jump in to discipline and punish. Let's talk about biopower and what makes Foucault's analysis of biopower possible, which is the extension of his genealogical treatment to the question of sexuality in the first volume of The History of Sexuality. This book is one that, in a sense, displaces sex as the object of truth in the discourse on sexuality. Foucault questions whether sex is truly what is at the core of discourses on sexuality. Foucault writes this, is sex really the anchorage point that supports the manifestations of sexuality? Or is it not a rather complex idea that was formed inside the deployment of sexuality? Foucault flips and then moves to overturn the conventional understanding of discourses on sexuality. Foucault writes that we must not place sex on the side of reality and sexuality on the side of confused ideas and illusions. One way to understand this, and one really interesting development that has occurred in disability studies, has been a discussion about the way in which we treat notions of disability and impairment. We posit disability on the side of confused ideas and illusions, and we posit impairment on the side of a natural truth. But Foucault wants to overturn these ideas. Foucault wants to break down this notion that at the core of sex is some anxious truth. Foucault finds it fascinating and almost comical that his contemporaries, like Marcuse and the Reichians, invest so much energy in ending the supposed regime of silence regarding what Foucault calls the noisiest of our preoccupations. Like Touk and Pinel and the myth of their exposure of the evils of the asylum. Foucault believes that the same dynamic exists with the Freudo Marxists, who posit Freud as a figure that revealed to us or tore away the regime of silence that was encasing sexuality. From the confession and the catechumen, all the way to the policing of families, to the social sciences, to psychology, to the way in which we approach masturbation, the family, the family unit, the breakdown of the house, how to monitor your husband, your wife. For Foucault, the discourse on sex has been a noisy one. And this idea that it is in fact beneath some sort of tarp or repressed and hidden away is, to him, historically false. Biopolitics is a complicated term. One that can often seem somewhat separate from the discourse or the analytic of sex and sexuality. However, the biopolitical apparatus, as Foucault sees it, is quite reliant on it. Just as technologies of disciplinary power change the way in which power takes hold of the body, biopolitical apparatuses are fundamental to the way in which power takes hold of life. In the second half of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th, a new pole starts to develop alongside the pole of the anatomo-political, one that focuses on biological processes, propagation, births, mortality, levels of health, life expectancy, and its longevity, and all the conditions that can cause those things to vary, such as famine, such as reproduction rates, such as the distribution of birth control or the distribution of goods and services. These poles are now established. On one side, we have 
the human machine with Lemaitre and the Napoleonic instructors on one side, and of course their responses to Leibnizianism. And on the other end, we have the physiocrats and the emerging technocrats who are not so much interested in managing the individual, but managing the population. Disciplinary power and the biopolitical apparatus have a sort of dovetail at the point of normalization, but they focus on two very different grids. Disciplinary power on the grid of the individual and biopower on the grid of the population. However, in order to adequately discuss biopolitics in any adequate way, we have to return to the sovereign and its right to life. For a long time, one of the characteristic privileges of sovereign power, Foucault writes, was the right to decide life and death, patrias potestas. Sovereign power was, and still is, defined in many ways by the use of the sword. The sovereign exercised his right to life only by exercising his right to kill, or by refraining from killing. The sovereign's privilege and mode of defense is to kill or to let live. However, Foucault notes a profound transformation took place in the West. The right to life fundamentally changed. The procedures of the administration of life emerge as the threshold of modernity for Foucault. Now the risk is different. The existence in question is no longer the juridical existence of sovereignty. At stake is the biological existence of the population. At stake is not the sovereign, but the biological security of the entire population. Foucault tactfully takes up the notion of the death penalty here. Criminals are no longer put to death to rectify the power of the body of the sovereign. Wars are no longer fought in the name of the king. The existence of everyone is what is put at stake. One is no longer killed for their affront to sovereign power or even to the commonwealth in a remarkable display of force. They're killed because they present a biological threat. I'll now quote Foucault at length. Those who died on the scaffold became fewer and fewer, in contrast to those who died in wars. But it was for the same reasons that the latter became more numerous and the former more and more rare. As soon as power gave itself the function of administering life, its reason for being and the logic of its exercise and not the awakening of humanitarian feelings made it more and more difficult to apply the death penalty. How could power exercise its highest prerogatives by putting people to death when its main role was to ensure, sustain, and multiply life, to put this life in order? For such a power, execution was at the same time a limit, a scandal, and a contradiction. Hence, capital punishment could not be maintained except by invoking less the enormity of the crime itself than the monstrosity of the criminal his incorrigibility, and the safeguard of society. One had the right to kill those who represented a kind of biological danger to others. It was no longer a question of letting live or of taking life. The seizure of life was completely rearranged. The biopolitical order is one that lets die. It operates either to foster life or to disallow it to the point of death. Perhaps the other pole of the biopolitical power that administers and propagates life is the thanatopolitics that disallows it to the point of death. These several pages of the history of sexuality come to constitute a remarkable moment in Foucault's academic career and his trajectory, and may very well be the most important pages of this text, perhaps publicly maybe his whole career. With the entrance of biopower into Foucault's work, power is no longer simply that which can erect systems of enclosure around the body, train it, run through the fiber of its musculature, its behaviors, and render it docile. Power is now dealing with life itself. One would have to speak in terms of biopower to designate it as what brought life and its mechanisms into the realm of explicit calculations and made knowledge power an agent of the transformation 
of human life. The threshold of modernity is reached for Foucault when political strategies become that which wager on the management of life and of the species. It is also in this text that Foucault provides a more formal criticism of the way in which political theorists portray power. Foucault doesn't want his readers to come away presuming that when he discusses power, he is discussing merely a set of rigid institutions, a pure mode of subjection or subjugation, or a simple system of domination. Power cannot be sought in one particular station. It is not possessed in that way. It's executed in relations. Power is exercised, not possessed. A crucial and formally explicit addition in Foucault's notion of power that is in many ways still present in Discipline and Punish but not fully enunciated is the function of resistance. This resistance exists within a strategic grid, and it also directs the development of power relations. This multiplicity of resistance refers to what Foucault calls a dense web that passes through apparatuses and institutions without being exactly localized in them. It is in this collection of points of resistance that Foucault says, make a revolution possible. So one way to understand this would be, it is through resistance that one can understand the development of particular modes of subjugation, particular strategies and tactics that power needs to respond to. For Foucault, in many ways, or fundamentally, resistance precedes power because it is through the analytic of resistance that power develops. It is through resistance that we come to know the violence of power. So now that we've discussed all that, it's probably time to discuss methodology and genealogy explicitly, although we've touched on it. Foucault's genealogical method is, to him, what sets apart discipline and punish and the history of sexuality from other historical works that deal with topics such as sovereignty, population sciences, security, sex, perversity, madness, and punishment. Genealogy is an approach to history that does not attempt to construct a linear developmental understanding of its objects of analysis. A genealogy must record the singularity of events outside of any monotonous finality. It possesses no teleological trajectories. It's fundamentally opposed to a Kojevian notion of history or of dialectical development within history. And this point is crucial, and it underwrites some of the laden political elements of discipline and punish. Far from being an ascent to a humane and gentle mode of correction, the impact of the birth of disciplinary societies and the human sciences was a juridical apparatus whose goal was not to punish less, but to punish better. Like his predecessor Nietzsche, Foucault's notion of genealogy opposes itself to a search for origins. Foucault refers to discipline and punish as a genealogy of the present political and scientific complex from which power derives its basis, its justifications, and its rules, but crucially, not its origins. And one unique strength of Foucault's genealogy, and I think one that separates it from that of Nietzsche's, is its proliferation of minor histories and of subjugated knowledges. It overturns the conventional histories of power and sovereign right that one finds in Boulanvier, in Hobbes, or even in Machiavelli. It prioritizes the experiences of power in other accounts the mad, the perverse, the incorrigible, the criminal, and the degenerate. Genealogies are not meant to establish themselves as new formalized and institutionally supported knowledges. They are an insurrection against those very forms of power knowledge and its productive processes. Genealogy is a counter methodology that values what other modes of archival work and historical analysis would deem marginal. Genealogy momentarily recenters defeated and vanquished knowledges, moments, figures, and people. Genealogy must seek its objects of analysis in what Foucault calls places that we tend to feel are without history. Genealogy is, and it must remain, a method of resistance that recognizes the force and political violence that comes with the practice of history, the violence of what it means to tell a history. No genealogy ever functions to vindicate power. No genealogy ever functions to provide a justification of power. Because power 
is without any inherent justification. Power finds its justification in the histories we tell ourselves. And I think we're seeing, certainly contemporarily, the development or the attempt at deploying genealogy to do this. But this is not genealogical work. It can be more adequately described as a scholastic apologetics of sovereignty, of the administration of life, of the organization of life, and the power to take it. Genealogy has to ask questions like, what does it mean for a society to say that it precedes history? Or what is being said? What is being marginalized when one says that Marxism is a science? One could argue that Foucault recognizes the weight of his endeavor in a way that very few of his predecessors or contemporaries or successors do. And I think we would be well fit to recognize this consequence, this weight as well in our work as students, in our work as philosophers, in our work as readers and as writers. Thank you.